Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the television festival. Uh, anyone that's picked up a newspaper this morning or was on uh, YouTube last night will have seen the stir that, that this man made in the McTaggart lecture. Um, I was listening to him slightly earlier today uh, doing a, a bit of a promotional video, uh, and he was asked how he felt about doing it, and he said that you're the first staff that's done it, the yeah, first kind of below first, stairs staff. First employed person. Right. Which means, of course, I've got bosses. And of course, they all wanted to know what the hell I was going to say. Was, I, was, you, I, gonna, was I going to finally sink the ship? <laughs> and did you let them see the copy first? Yes, though possibly not the one I delivered. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> Several drafts. Well, there was a, a piece that I picked out of it last night, <clears throat> sorry, which uh, was a quote you said, which says, the time in which we live is the most challenging and difficult, yet potentially the most exciting of any age in the modern media's history. That's a, that's a bold statement, John. It's a bold statement, Ruth, but I think it is true. I, I think the difficult times are about the disconnection and division that I tried to spell out, but the opportunities are absolutely fantastic. I mean, it is extraordinary that disconnection, as I described it, can have arrived and, and developed in the way that it has at a time when we are so connected, um, you, you, more connected than ever in history. And I, 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 even our job is so different now. I mean, you know, you'd go out into the field in 1976 and you'd have a film camera. It would take, um, you know, well, if anything happened after, after four o'clock in the afternoon, <laughs> there was no chance it was going to get on the telly because it had to get into the labs, be, be, be processed. Then the film had to be edited. You know what this is? That's three seconds of text. <laughs> they would take the film, stick it on the end of their nose, put it out to that line and say, John, that's it. And then it would go down onto the film deck and it'd be edited. It's extraordinary. And now we just... There it is. Well, I, um, I read in your autobiography a, a story about the change uh, in technology, and, and you have the distinction of being the first person in the history of the world that has ever interviewed any pope in English. Ah, yes. But you couldn't even really show the film. <laughs> that was so tragic. We, we, we had double system, which normal, normally in news we worked on one system, which meant the camera filmed both the sound and the, and the pictures. But on this occasion, we had double systems. So there was one man with the sound and one man with the, with, with, with the film. And unfortunately, uh, we were never able to synchronize the lips of the Pope with the sound. And, and it, it was never perfected. And eventually, I got the sound and threw it in the sea. And that was the end of that interview. And of course, if I'd kept it, we could have synced it all up. It would all be electronically done. And we could do it, play it 20 years on. So there's some barnacles at the bottom of the sort of Bay of Mexico that's there nibbling are. away at Pope John Paul's first English words on broadcast. He's still talking. He's still talking. <laughs> uh, in terms of the changes, both in, in technology and how that has changed the way uh, yeah. we represent news, um, wh when I started, I was a, a journalist before I was elected. When I started, um, the best example I had, because I hadn't been a journalist at the time of the first Gulf War, mm. when you still had the six and the nine, or the mm -hmm, six and the mm -hmm, ten, mm -hmm. and everything was an edited package, but I, I was a journalist by the time of the, the second war. Um, and I remember working at the BBC, and we were leading all day with a report from John Simpson, who'd had a, a rocket or an IED go off quite next to him, mm -hmm. and he had a bit of blood running down his face, and some editor in London, who'd never been to Iraq in his life, had decided that this was the most important thing, because it was dramatic, but it mm -hmm. had nothing to do with anything strategically in the war. It was no mm -hmm. advance. It, was, it wasn't telling a story. And do you think that some of the changes, like 24-hour news, like um, social media, have impacted more than we could possibly have imagined on how news is now told? Ruth, blood on the face of John Simpson is a, <laughs> a very, very, very big event. Um, no, I, I mean, but, but seriously, uh, I think it swings and roundabouts. I mean... Mm. You know, we, we tend to forget how difficult it was to get reliable information. And I mean, now you've got your smartphone and you can Google, and, and, and of course not everything on Google is obviously dependable, but if you can pick up the New York Times, you know, or you can, you know, see the Guardian or whatever it is, the FT, suddenly there is the answer to the question you, you, you wanted answered. So you, your access to information is like never before. But your choice of information therefore becomes important. It, it, your editorial activity is very, very important. That is true. Um, you really have to make serious judgments about how you're going to handle this. 
But one of the things that you said in your, your lecture last night was the opportunities that Channel 4 News has had mm. um, through social media. So you would have maybe five to six million viewers a week mm -hmm. on the TV. Mm -hmm. um, and you've now had three billion yes. Facebook views. So if you're in an editorial meeting and you've got a correspondent that's putting a package together and there's typically three voices, there's a, a pro-voice, an anti-voice and a neutral expert mm -hmm. voice. The way you package that up, you do the voices separately. So if one voice, the pro voice, gets a thousand views, mm -hmm. and one gets a hundred thousand views, and that's the anti voice, do you feel that you've ever let people down in terms of editorial control? Oh, endlessly, yeah. I right. think it's true. I, I, I think it is very, very difficult to make snap judgments and get these things a hundred percent right. But but you do work at trying to achieve balance, and of course, in in, in a way, we're regulated to ensure that we do. Um, but getting those voices right is, is, is difficult, and it's it very unwise, I think, to put them out separately. I think we would try to put them out together if we possibly can. Mm. And uh, I think we're going to talk a little bit about uh, social media, Google, mm -hmm, Facebook, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the fact that you have spoken and Mark Zuckerberg has trembled overnight in a couple of minutes' time. But uh, I, I hear that we have a very special question uh, that's going to be shown on the screen behind us. Um, about a, a secret past of yours, and it might be somebody that you recognise, because if you Google Ruth, your can, name, can, can we stop there? this person comes up. Let's have a wee look. Hello, John Snow. This is the other one here. <laughs> uh, a grumpy one with the less colourful socks. This is amazing. I uh, wanted to congratulate you on your lecture and also ask you a couple of questions. So, my first question is, what is your favourite Beatles song and can you still hold a tune? Now, there is a history to this, because one of your first forays uh, out of university was in a Beatles tribute yes, band? Yes, yes, yes. To, Wh to which one India. were you? Huh? Which one were you? I, I sang bass. It was a, a four-part close harmony one, and I, I sang Barbershop bass. Beatles. Barbershop Beatles. Uh, well, I mean, yesterday. All oh, my troubles seem so far away. Now Join it in. seems as though they're here mm, to stay. stay. Oh, oh, I believe in yesterday. Why she <laughs> had to go, I don't know. She didn't say. <laughs> well, can I just say? Thank you very much, Kit. That was really nice. I like that. Oh, he's coming back. Oh he's my got another God. question later. Oh, my God. Uh, but I, I think I can guarantee that that's going to be a Facebook He's actually hit. a lovely man, a really nice guy. I had to interview him as Jon Snow. And at the end of the interview, I said, Jon Snow, you know nothing. And he said, bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and both statements were correct. <laughs> Can I make a terrible, terrible confession in that I've never watched Game of Thrones? Can I make it even more terrible? <laughs> I only watched one edition in order to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> the fakery of television right there. Um, let's come back to social media because one of the really explicit criticisms that you had, and I'd say it was a criticism last night, was that the duopoly of Google and Facebook mm. have meant that when traditional um, news outlets were looking to replace traditional forms of income with a digital stream, it kind of destroyed that. And we've seen a, a hollowing out of, of journalists and newsrooms mm. because of it. Mm. But we've, well, had, a, we've, we've, we've had an overnight yeah. um, development. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what Mark Zuckerberg has said? Well, well just, just to build up to it, I mean, mm. the, thing, the, 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 the awful thing that's happened as a result of the wonders of Facebook and Google, of course, is that obviously... Advertising has gone online. There is nothing to sustain local journalism. And, and it has, uh, lots of newspapers have gone out of business and lots of local journalism has, has collapsed altogether. And that means, of course, that the, the local just isn't covered well. And the centre, which we're already bored with already, uh, is getting more and more attention. And, and that isn't good. It isn't good for you. I mean, particularly, it's a very, very London heady, heavy uh, entity. So what, what uh, I mean... What we discovered very early on was that the way to crack uh, the social networks was to provide something which you didn't have to listen to, but you could look at on your smartphone. And so we do pictures and captions. 
and, and it's been a vast success. That's why... And you were the first real major news organisation yeah. to subtitle everything yeah. that you put out on the internet, just because yeah. some people want to have a look at something when they're in a meeting and they can't have They're on a up. bus or whatever, and yeah. they, they're not going to plug in and sort of sort it out. They, they just quickly whip up, and there it is. Um, and and uh, the problem is that, of course, it is driving more and more people to Facebook and more and more people to... Uh, uh, YouTube and, and various other things. And, and the problem is that it, it's not cheap to produce because it, you have to have a different team working at it. We have uh, some 15 working online and not actually working for the TV program. Um, and that costs money. And we get a very, very, very nominal fee. Well, what happened last night was about 35 minutes after I sat down, Mark Zuckerberg issued a statement. I, I have no idea what it had to do with the fact that I'd been talking, although we did release what I was going to say uh, at nine o'clock yesterday morning, so it was mm. perfectly possible people rang up Facebook and said, what's your reaction to this being called the dark cancer, which thought I... And, and the dark cancer is this gobbling up of our resource. Anyway, he says that he is going to um, a, a trial uh, US and... He's going to select some US and um, European... Um, news um, makers, and um, he will allow us to grow subscriptions uh, through Facebook, and that he will not take any of the money, which means a really enormous breakthrough. It means we'll be able to earn significant amounts of money from Facebook. But he says quite a lot of things. We've got to see it happen. He also says he's going to make sure that all publishers' logos are next to pieces, yep. so yep. that people know the veracity of yep. it. And so if they want to be pointed towards, mm. actually, I think I will get Well, I mean, that is a useful X. way of combating fake news, although mm. you can put fake logos, can't well, you? I mean, <laughs> it's easily done. Um, but the fake news is an interesting one, because at the same time this week, as you were considering mm. what you were going to say and, and others, we had, a, you know, we had the President of the United States haranguing mm. um, you know, state broadcasters, serious news organisations. Um, you know, at length in public. I mean, has there ever been a time when the conventional news organisations have ever felt so under threat, do you think, in terms of, of what they do? Well, I mean, has there ever been a time when there's been such an individual, if he is an individual? I mean... Yeah. <laughs> you think there's more than one of them? Uh, well, who knows? Uh, there's a lot of hair there. I don't know what's underneath <laughs> it. Um, but but uh, seriously, I mean... Um, this is the difficulty. I mean, mm. uh, there are things he says you think must be fake. I mean, did he really say it? And yes, he did. That's the, the, it is a difficult time, a very difficult time. I think he might walk away in the end. He might say, you know, these people are bad people, the worst people in the world. They're, make, they're making, well, us, but all of us, mm. they're getting in the way, and, you know, um, I'm not going to put up with it. I'm going to come back and join you and then start some ghastly countrywide revolution. Who knows? Well, on that sobering thought, um, have a wee think about questions you want for John as well. We will go to the, to the floor. Um, we've also had some questions that have come in through the All Singing, All Dancing uh, mm. app that was created for the television festival. I'm really touched that old kid Harrington agreed to talk. Oh, and, he, and he's coming back, John. Oh he's coming God. back. Oh you might have an inkling of what he might ask you, but we'll get to that, I'm sure. So. Um, an anonymous person, and probably once you hear the question, you'll, you'll know why, uh, has written in to say, what's giving you such longevity on television? And can anyone starting out now realistically expect to still have a job in their 60s in, on TV? I, I think they can realistically, because, I mean, you know, uh, 60 is the old 50 or 45 or whatever. P people are, are, are living better lives longer. They may not necessarily be living longer, but they're living fuller lives longer. Um, Can yeah. women expect women? to have TV jobs in their 60s? We have got, I think, five women, four women on air who are over 50. I won't name them, but <laughs> because they look 40, but, you know, well, no, even less. Uh, but but we, we, we do, we do, we do have uh, seriously old women on the television. <laughs> Oh. Sorry, girls. <laughs> Good luck going back into the office now. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and do we have a question from the floor? Anybody got anything they want to ask John? Anyone been screaming at their television? Uh, yeah, yes, the lady there. Yeah. The, I think we've got a microphone just coming up to you. 
Oh, love the three. That's good. Yeah. Here we go. If you could let us know your name as well, thanks. Hi, John. It's Miranda from Broadcast Magazine. Mm. Um, you said in your speech you described it as a nominal fee or next to nothing, but are you able to give us a ballpark figure or give us more you know, clarity on how much Facebook really pays? Actually, I genuinely don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I, one of the things I safeguarded myself with in my speech was that I was not a manager and I'm not a director. I couldn't manage a paper bag, so um, I, I genuinely don't know. But I know it's very small. Um, uh, I, I have no idea. But I, I hope that he's talking about, well, if he's allowing us to get subscriptions, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be the rate for the job. Oh, the lady with the hand up just there next to Mike 3. And those of you who aren't professional journalists, we don't all like talking to ourselves, do think if you want to pitch in, uh, have a wee think about something you want to see as well. Disappointingly, another journalist, <laughs> Catherine Rushton from the Daily Mail. Um, You've been very generous to me this morning. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you've Where said are you, Catherine? I'm here. Oh, I see you, yeah, lovely. You've said um, that you can't remember saying fuck the Tories, but is it a sentiment that you share? How many um, verses of it did you sing, George? Let's, <laughs> let, let's be perfectly clear, there were no expletives in my, um, in my speech yesterday, in case there's any misunderstanding. I think you might have been referring to the allegation made against me at, at, at of, all, of all places, uh, that wonderful uh, festival. Um, uh, I mean, I said I have absolutely no recollection, and, and I, I still have absolutely no recollection. I think one has to... Have you ever been to Glastonbury? I have. Well, then you will know of what I speak. I mean... <laughs> uh, Glastonbury is an utterly wonderful experience, but uh, it is, A, magnificently noisy, B, full of all sorts of substances, and worse than that, if you have a face that's recognisable, you get subjected to endless selfies. I mean, maybe eight or nine hundred selfies. I was absolutely, you, and you know, the problem is, if you're a TV person, you can't just say, well, get stuffed. I, I don't do that sort of thing. Because you've got to be a continuation of the person that you are in their living room, looking at that deep pile carpeting in front of their gorgeous television. Um, but, but quite seriously, I mean, uh, what worried me was... I was, you know, as I say, I'm pretty certain I had never said it, and it's not the sort of thing I would say, and it's not something I believe. Um, but just supposing there was a group of people around me who were actually shouting that. I didn't hear it, but just supposing there was. And, uh, you know, I was sort of going, ah, well, what are you going, ah, to? I have no idea, absolutely no idea. So, you know, I think you have to sort of view where it happened and the kind of... Uh, melee that there is when these things happen. I might charitably suggest that you're asking us to give more context Don't tell me I was to the question. I wasn't. No, 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 no. Context to the question. <laughs> then you might give an interviewee that came yeah. on your t news programme, yeah. uh, say, for example, a Conservative Secretary of State or yes. something like that, and say, I've had a do you know... Of, I've had a number of Secretary of States on since, and they've been very generously not no, asking me about no, it. No, absolutely. But if you ask them a, a difficult question, yeah, yeah. and they turned around and said, do you know what? I was at a festival... I'd had a, a drink, mm. I can't actually remember, you would take that as an acceptable answer mm. and wouldn't want to then further press them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a very... That, 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 that's a, a testing point. Um, <laughs> but, um, I mean, that's it. I mean, I don't know where much further I go. I'm, I'm in the same position as the Conservative politician that I once wanted to be. Well, I heard As about I this. said in my speech. Mm. I, I think rather than be a conservative politician, because we're, we're not all the same, um, you looked I've, at, I've noticed, at uh, yeah. uh, the Prime Minister, Mr Macmillan, and thought, I like his big house, I like his big car, and I like his big coat. Mm. Um, so perhaps it was the material rather than the substantive that you were interested in. Maybe. He seemed quite a sweet old guy too. Nice. OK. How many Prime Ministers have you met, just out of interest? Not just of this country. Oh, uh, <laughs> quite a lot. I mean, I, don't know, I really have no idea. Maybe 40 or 50? Because there's a, a wonderful story um, that uh, I, I read. You must have met many more than I have. Oh, I think so. They all want to meet you. <laughs> I'm not so sure about that, but um, a wonderful story that I read that you once almost killed Idi Amin. 
Uh, well, this was a, a tricky one. I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> he's, uh, he's, he's quite big. You know, because, because I'd done VSO in, in, in Uganda, I'd actually met him mm. uh, when I was a teacher, uh, you know, aged 18. And uh, the reason I met him was because I used to have to drive the school boxing team, the 250 miles to Kampala, to the national championships. And who should be refereeing in the finals but Idi Amin Dada? And uh, Amin said to me when I pitched up with our two final contestants, he said, you're very tall for a white man. Your mother must have eaten much pawpaw. My poor old mother didn't know what a pawpaw was. There wasn't even a branch of Waitrose in those days. <laughs> and uh, uh, anyway, it, I, he sort of claimed to recognize me when, a few years later, I turned up in Uganda to, 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 to report on him. And he invited me to his village in West Nile, which is a long way away. The, the French had just given him a falcon jet. And he was very excited and said, would I come with him and my cameraman? And, I sat here, and he sat there, and my, well, there was a burly air stewardess behind us who was clearly more than an air stewardess, and then my cameraman was there. And oh, you know the thing about Idi Amin? Every time you ever appeared, he ever appeared, he was dressed in a different fatigue, and today he was a Texas Ranger, and he had a large Stetson on. And we took off, and almost immediately, the Stetson fell down over the face. <laughs> He was asleep, well, it sounded like it, looked like it. And then I looked down and literally his seat was there and hanging down was a, a gun in a holster. And I did say to myself, should I shoot him? <laughs> I mean, what do you do? You're confronted with a tyrant who's murdered half his people and there he's sitting with a gun asleep with a Stetson over his head. And, and, and I thought, now what happens when you shoot a very fat man in a highly pressurized falcon jet <laughs> Does it ricochet around inside the body or does it go through the body, through the fuselage and suck you out the size of a pea? Are you decompressed to this sort of, and is that the end? And, and I'm afraid my courage failed me. But was there also a question of who would win in a fight between a very tall thin man and a quite broad trained Oh, I had no doubt about that. I knew I would. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the reasons I ask is because having sat across uh, from so many world leaders in your time, there is a, another question that Kit Harrington wanted to put to you. So let's have a wee look at the, the VT we've got. God, what are you going to ask? Referencing the now infamous quote from Game of Thrones, <laughs> was there ever a time in your career when you found yourself sat opposite someone interviewing them and you suddenly did find that you, Jon Snow, knew nothing? Fuck at me. Um, <laughs> um, do you know, uh, can I have two? You can have as many as you like. This is your show. I'm just here to My facilitate dear, it. You're, so, you're, you're not anything like the person I thought you were going to be. I thought you were, I thought you were going to be ruthless. <laughs> I've not got there yet. This is an aperitif. Ah. Um, <laughs> shit. Uh, no. Um, do you know, one was very recent. Um, it was called Wayne Marks. Wayne Marks. Wayne Marks was a British transport policeman who fought off the three uh, dagger-wielding lunatics on London Bridge. And many, many weeks after the attack, he was finally allowed to meet a member of the press, and I went in to interview him. And he was one of the most remarkable people I have ever, ever, ever met. I mean, he had the presence of a great actor, a great, a great policeman, a great military officer. He was a young black man who'd been in the transport police for two years, and he had quite literally uh, dashed onto the bridge, met the first of the attackers, been stabbed by him. The next one came up, stabbed him again. The third one came up, and he, he described, he said, and then the third one came up, pale shirt. And I thought, how incredible to sort of have a vivid account of the person who's trying to kill you. And he held these three off to appalling mortal injuries to himself, clearly a huge, terrible gash in his 
thigh. And I think, well, saved very, very many more lives. I mean, I, a dozen at least, I should think. Um, he actually kept these three people going, you know. And um, so he was very, very remarkable. And then uh, there was a wonderful doctor in Paris after the bombing there. And she was beautifully articulate and very, very moving. And in fact, I must admit that in both cases, I cried. Um, the great thing is, if you're there and you've only got one camera, it doesn't spot it. It doesn't see you doing it. it only sees her and him. There's, um, there's some stories that stay with you always um, mm. when you're a journalist. And, mm. and even years later, you find, in times when your mind is idle, you, you go back to them. Mm. What, um, case, what do you go back to? I thought I was interviewing you, but um, okay. No, I'm rather intrigued. Okay, um, so there was one job I was sent out on, and, and when you're a young, young reporter, uh, you get sent to do the death knocks. Although actually, Facebook means less likely that you do now to mm. speak to the family or the neighbours to see if you can get a photograph and all these sorts of things, and it's really tough. There was one in, in Glasgow where a young boy had been out walking his dog uh, in a graveyard across the road from his house, and um, it had been pouring in rain and some old mine workings that nobody knew existed opened up underneath him, and the ground swallowed him. God. Awful. And it was a quagmire, and there were some mine rescue people that went, you know, they took half a day to get up from wherever they got to. There was never a chance that boy was going to live. It was a recovery operation. There was a woman who, in Perth, who was agoraphobic and had postnatal depression, and who left the house, and there was a big search for her, and it turned out that she'd walked four miles up the nearest big hill called Canoe Hill, and she'd waited at the top, and there's a, a tablet of stone at the top, and she'd, a baby and a toddler, carried them both up with her. She'd changed the baby's nappy before she picked them off, both up and jumped off. Oh. Um, I remember that one. And I, when I was a very young journalist in Kosovo, um, I was staying inside the wire with the, yeah. with the army because we were over there just at the end of the war. And it was the first time I, I'd ever seen the kind of results of something really bad. And, mm. and there was a, a car that had been brought inside the pound inside the wire and it, a family of four had been killed by a sniper trying to get out of, of Pristina. And um, I, can, I can actually, if I close my eyes now, I can see it. I can see the hair and skull cap fragments in the roof of the car. I can see in the dashboard some brain matter. And I remember thinking, the first time I saw it, I remember thinking, I never knew it was grey. That's why they call it grey matter. And there was oh. a smell, yeah. um, very sweet, that I've never smelled since, but mm. I know that, and that was 2001, so that was 16 years ago. And mm. I know that if I ever smelt it again, I would never, ever confuse it for anything mm. else. And they're the three that stay with me. And last night you indicated that Grenfell Tower is one that is going to stay with you forever. Definitely, definitely. I, I'm, I won't ask you lots of questions, but just one mm. question more. Did, did journalism make you want to become a politician, or are you always going to be a politician? No, no, no. Journalism made me want to become a politician. It also made me join the Territorial Army, actually, that time. I knew also. that. Aren't you a colonel or something? Um, I'm, I'm, uh, have gone back, but I joined properly to, to actually serve. What, what rank are you? Colonel? Uh, I'm an honorary colonel, which means that I'm not currently serving. I'm, I'm helping the regiment I used to work but with. But if the worst happened, you'd immediately be Colonel Davidson. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I help those that serve. And it's see. a five-year tour. Quite a lot of politicians have done it, actually. But, yeah. um, but no, so I, was, I, I joined a couple of years after I came back from Kosovo mm. to serve properly and mm. do all the training and all the rest of it. Mm. But, um, but no, absolutely, journalism I loved um, and loved reporting on what was happening. But... Mm. The job is to tell people what's going on. Mm. It's not always to change what's going mm. on. And that's, well, that that's so, why you change sides. That's that was why what I was so sides. rare last night for me. That was the first mm. political speech I'd made since I was a rebellious student. I mean, you can't make a speech like that. But suddenly you're offered the McTaggart lecture and you can say what the hell you like. Well, until your boss is... <laughs> <how's it going? laughs> but um, but the, the point about Grenfell is you, you genuinely think that that is one of the pivotal events well, in I, history and, and in news that's going to change things? Well, I want it to change things. I mean, um, uh, it was the fact that in the 21st century, something so utterly wanton and crude and man-made could happen anymore. I mean, it wasn't like an airliner malfunctioning and killing and however many people. It was something that had been constructed in such a way that it would kill the people inside. And that is just a terrible thing to think about. And then the knowledge that there were up to 600 towers elsewhere in Britain, some of them here in Scotland, uh, 29 in Salford alone, that have the same cladding. I mean, this is terrifying. And you've drawn a link before 
if not a direct, then at least in some way a causal link between the gutting of, of local news, of local news being picked up by national mm, titles, mm, mm, mm. to the idea that, that actually it was known at Grenfell, mm. some of the issues that existed, mm. but it hadn't been publicised. And if you look on the internet, before it happened, there was these same complaints that in any other world, in any other time, mm. would have made news as it yep. was going on. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. And that, that's why, you know, the, the denuding of local um, is, is so terrifying and, and does lie at the door of the duopoly that I was talking about. But if, if there's regeneration this way, um, maybe we can invest more in local and less in central. I think one of the themes that you were talking about um, was about the, the division and the fraction and the lack of diversity, mm. the liberal elite of news, as you called it, which is something I'd, I'd quite like to get onto. Uh, and to get away from the liberal elite of news, if we have any real people, not reporters in, that would like to ask John a question, uh, do we have anyone that would like to put their hand up? There, there couldn't be any real people yep. at a TV there we go. festival. <laughs> Lady there in the middle of the, the row, yes. Uh, a microphone is coming towards you. Hi, thank you. My name is Inga Thorder. I work for CNN. Um, ah, not a real person, oh. <laughs> rather than a reporter. But go on, Inga. I, I do want to ask a very important question because John did touch on this a lot in his lecture last night, which I, by the way, thought was absolutely terrific. Um, I, I've spent 15 years in, this, in newsrooms in this country, um, and I think pretty much for the whole time there has been talk about diversity, of lack of diversity, about issues and how we do it, and yet nothing happens. It mm. just seems to be that there is something that is... I know there's a massive block there. I don't know where it is. It could well be in the leadership, as you mentioned. Um, but, I mean, I would really like your thought about why, after all this talk and after everything, we're not making any headway on this still. And maybe second to that, how damaging do you think it was for our industry, the gender pay gap that came out with the BBC figures? Well, I, I think the gender pay gap was damaging for everybody. It, it illustrated that actually at no level in our society is there parity of pay en masse. And it's perfectly wrong for men and women doing the same job to be paid different amounts of money. Um, I mean, there are other factors that can come into determining pay levels, um, experience, length of service, and all that sort of thing. But, but actually, simply to determine a, a pay scale on the basis that you're a man or a woman um, is, is, is just completely wrong. Now, um, I, I mean, I think the problem is there have not been enough imaginative programs. One of the things that I wanted to happen and suggested uh, yesterday was that um, organizations should be more liberal with allowing people a day off a fortnight uh, half a day to, uh, every week uh, to go and do something in the community uh, and link up with people you know that some people are not obviously sort of necessarily disposed to wanting to do something in the community maybe they can do something else but something which exposes them more to people who are not necessarily like themselves, uh, and, and possibly leads to strands of stories and the rest of it. But the, 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 the biggest thing is obviously sort of um, uh, bringing people in on, um, you know, um, scholarships and all sorts. There are all sorts of ways, apprenticeships and the rest of it. I don't have the answers. I just expose the problem. Um, and I think it, it behoves the people who who are managing these organisations together with the rest of us, are coming up with ways of doing it. I mean, as I said, the TV festival itself has even come up with a way, um, but, but we need to do much better. Uh, we do, but our apprenticeship scheme at my place is only two or three years old, but it's already having an amazing impact, and, and we need to expand it. John, on the gender pay gap, does Samira Ahmed and Cathy Newman get paid the same as you and Krishna Gurumurthy? I actually have no idea, but pretty obviously they don't. I mean, I doubt very much they do. Um, uh, but even paying us all the same might be very nice for us, but it will make no difference to the people on the steelworks floor who are paid differently from the women. I mean, we, we must have pay, parity of pay across all genders. And across... All industries that are comparable levels yes. of skill, levels of, yes. even if they're I not mean, the same industry. I mean, 
Look, I, I'm not, I said last night, I'm not a manager, I'm not a director. I don't know how you organize these things, but mm. uh, you know, I, I've been there 28 years. Um, I don't know whether that, that factors into my pay or not. I mean, I don't know how on earth they arrived at what I am paid. Um, but there you are. Do you get a tie allowance? A tie allowance? No. Oh, no. I have never bought a tie on expenses. <laughs> and I'm actually a complete idiot because the tie for me has now become a fetish. You know, I, I, I am completely obsessed with them. Uh, and indeed, I hate to have to tell you, but the Design Museum in London is going to have an exhibition of my ties. Tremendous. <laughs> is this an exclusive? Is this the news the, line from today? The, this, is a, this is a world exclusive in, in November. John Snow fashion icon. Um, I'm afraid to say there, there's going to be sort of wonky bits of fabric are going to be draped around the museum and people can see just how crazy I am. But on the other hand, you know, you appear every night on television, you're in a dull, bloody suit. Anyway, wearing an exciting suit uh, would cost a fortune. Mm. Uh, and I thought ties would be nice and cheap. Actually, they're extremely expensive. Um, and uh, I thought the tie and the socks, um, that the socks were, I think those are rather nice socks, um, uh, the tie and the socks were the best way to express oneself. Uh, you know, and, and so it has proved. Anyway, you need your own, you know. Absolutely. Uh, Does anybody Robin Day had a bow tie and, you know. Does anybody send them in? Fortunately not. Right. Um, because actually, people who get your ties don't get it usually, sadly. And they're awfully nice ties, but dull as ditch water on television. <laughs> Sorry, anybody who sent one. <laughs> well, one of the things you were talking about was the, uh, the, the liberal elite. Yes. Um, and the fact that... A, Us, a, you and me. Well, some of us didn't have parents that went to Winchester and grandparents that no, went to no, Eton, no, John. No, no, I, but, but, but my point was actually we arrive at the yeah. liberal elite. We are now. Some you of are us are now. born into it. Ruth, some of us aren't. God, baby, you are now <laughs> the, the leader. Did you just call the, me baby? Well, as you know, <laughs> it's a term of endearment. <laughs> right, OK. Nobody uh, puts baby in the corner, you know that, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, I mean, it, 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 it's, you know, it's wonderful. I mean, it's wonderful that you are a leader of the Scottish Tories no, and you've revived... Flattery gets you away from the question. Let's get oh. back to the question oh, God, in terms of liberal woman. elites. Um, <laughs> do you think that's one of the reasons why lots of people that should know better in terms of analysing news got a lot of the really big world decisions wrong? They got Brexit wrong, they got Trump wrong, because the people that generally work in newspapers in, Cal sorry, in you know, networks in California and who work in, mm. dare I say, at the Channel 4 newsroom, mm. probably don't know that many people and certainly aren't people that would either vote for either Brexit or Trump. Th that's true, but I think the main thing is, did, did, did they go to Sunderland? Did they go to, mm. you know, uh, South Shields? Did they go to... Uh, Wigan. I mean, uh, you know, you've got to be exposed to people who think and live different lives altogether, and for whom austerity, for example, has been utterly devastating. And then it is extraordinary, isn't it? People will look back and say, how did they get away with punishing the working classes for the misdoings of the bankers in 2008? Because that is effectively what's happened. They have borne the brunt of austerity. I don't know how many people in this room really feel they have borne the brunt of austerity. And if, if you haven't, and you're not in touch with anyone who has, it doesn't make a judgment on how Brexit's going to do, go or indeed whether Trump gets elected and know, that was, for that was their own reasons. One of the things that you said, I think you can never write as well about what you don't actually physically witness. Mm. But oddly enough, I think there will be a rediscovery of the journalist as witness to history. It's faded at the moment, but it will come back. In the end, the internet is about content and they want people who've seen stuff. That's, a, again, a, a pretty big statement. How is it going to come back? If we've got the internet now and we've mm. got newsrooms which are populated now mm. by people who have to, because of the nature of the job, mm. sit in their backsides and, and download yeah, stuff but, and but look, all uh, of that, how, how do we get more correspondence well, well, the back internet, out? Well, the internet facilitates it. I right. Mean, if you, you take uh, the, the woman I talked about a lot yesterday, Wad al-Khatib. 25, mother of one with a baby on the way, the husband a doctor in the hospital, the last one in the last hospital in Aleppo. Um, and, and she pumps this witness, her own reports, out onto the internet, and half a billion people see them. Now, of course, we don't really know what effect that had. It didn't stop the war, mm. but at least we were aware to some extent of the suffering 
Um, but no, I mean, I think the, the ease of transmission, the ease of getting to places, uh, actually gives us a better chance to be witnesses to history. Um, you know, I mean, I'm still traveling a lot. I mean, I went to Iran to watch the, the elections there in May. It's absolutely intoxicating in a country that doesn't have any alcohol. Hmm. Marvelous. And you've got a bit of a love affair with Iran. I you? have a love affair with You've been going Persia. back and back and back. Back and back and back, probably 30 times. Persia and or, or Iran? No, Iran, but Persian yeah. culture. It's right. a beautiful thing, and it's one of the most beautiful countries on earth. Tehran's a bit sort of grubby, but, mm. but the rest is absolutely fantastic. And, you know, the, the Iranian people, you know, you are never unaware that it's a 6,000-year-old civilization. They didn't come out of tents, you know, 70 years ago. And it's incredible that we have decided, well... They're awful, awful people. We're not going to have anything to do with them. Um, it's a mistake. It's a terrible mistake. Because uh, uh, if we were to work with them, A, in, after Brexit, I can tell you, uh, that's where Mr. Liam Fox should be. He should be in Iran. I tell you, they're crying out for what we make. They love us here in Western Europe. They look west. They don't look east. And they want what we make. And, and, and a lot of our technical skills there is. One of the saddest things is that one of our richest uh, exports was the import of Iranian students at places like Imperial College. The numbers have dwindled to nothing, all in Germany and places, you know. We're just losing out by following the Americans. The Americans opened their embassy in Iran. You got me onto something here. <laughs> I, I, I can see I've unlocked the door. The Americans opened their, their embassy in Iran in 1951. We opened our first trading post in 1597. We've had all these years, hundreds of years, of, of relationships with Iran, and simply because the Americans got a very bloody nose over the hostage crisis. It was a terrible and ghastly thing which I was there to report. But they have never forgiven the Iranians, and they have sort of ensured that we follow them on this one. And we're losing our Farsi capacity in the Foreign Office and the rest of it. We were just throwing away a resource we had. We also have a, a number of the Armenian, Iranian diaspora yes, over here. we do. Who don't particularly talk fondly of many elements no, of No, but they talk fondly of their country and their yeah. culture. And, and that's, I mean, you never really affect a country until you begin to embrace its people and its culture. And once you do, things begin to move. You know, I mean, uh, and, and actually the mullahs are changing too, in all honesty. I mean... Um, th things were much, this was the most liberal time I've been there since the revolution. Uh, th it was very uplifting. One of the questions that Sorry we had that, in, no, 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 I am, um, I, as, as intriguing as this is, and this is something we can continue over a glass of red wine, I'm sure, at some it. other Let's time. Yeah. Um, but we've had a number of questions in from yes. before. Um, one of them uh, is uh, asking about the statements you've made on, and I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase here, statements you've made about, about being too uh, liberal elite-centric, too London-centric. Um, would you personally embrace Channel 4 News moving somewhere else in the way that other news organisations have done, get out of that M25 corridor? Well, you see, I don't... I don't you see, <laughs> there is a terrible secret, which I, I know there are people here from Channel 4, but I'm going to break it. Channel 4 doesn't make anything at all. It commissions people to make. It commissions... 300 more uh, independent uh, producers and companies to make things, and they are drawn from all over the country. I think they're altogether something like 1,700 independent production companies, you know, that are but, kind but of Channel available to them. The news is the studio is London-based, the anchor is London-based, the is editor true. is London-based, all that, of that. That is true, but we travel around a lot. Mm. I was in Aberdeen, Inverness, Glasgow, Edinburgh, all in the last four months, live, in, uh, from, from each of those at some point. Well, the election story was here. It's true. <laughs> it's true. Um, you know, the thing is, there are only a hundred of us. And we're very small. I don't know that we'd make a huge impact if we moved our headquarters. The real thing is to move our people, and to move them, and we do. We move them around the country. We do more live broadcasting than anybody of our size anywhere. Um, because I have to say, from somebody being 450 miles away from London, nothing gets on my wick more than screeds of news 
and time and effort and newsprint being devoted to a bloody clock that's going to stop ringing for a bit. Oh, well, I have to say... You're not alone, Ruth. I, I mean, I, I'm very lucky that in my job uh, I have to go up and down to London relatively often, so I'm up and down every month at least. But I mean, so I have heard it in the flesh. Lots of people haven't, but you just think, you probably can't even hear it a mile away. So hmm. apart from that one square mile, there's 99.99999% hmm. of the population in Look, the, the UK that's never you, heard you it. You know it never better will. than I do that, that there is a sort of central ele- ele- a sort hmm. of eccentricity of a certain sort of Brit, <laughs> uh, but they're very rare and rather old. Uh, and, and, and I didn't see lots of young people flogging around saying, oh, it's so awful, Big Ben's not... Uh, I'm going to be eight by the time this strikes again, <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, uh, it was absolute nonsense. But really much more, more serious is that that entire... You know better than I do, mm. that entire building is falling down. Mm. They're talking about spending £5.6 billion, pounds, uh, not, not over two years, but over eight years, which is far more expensive than doing it quick, shutting the whole thing down and forgetting it. Uh, And they're going to rebuild it with the two parties, the opposition and the government, still a sword and a half apart. And it's because we're a sword and a half apart that we have yaboo politics, people shouting each other like that, rather than perhaps consulting each other like this. I hate to break it to you, John, but the Scottish Parliament was designed in an amphitheatre, so there was no shouting. They're still shouting. I know there is, but you know what there is, Ruth, seriously, and, and I'm really taken with it. You can walk right into that, mm-hmm. that parliament. I mean, I, I, I'm always taken with the, the accessibility of it. And parliament is somebody else's place. It's not mine. It's not even yours. Mm-hmm. You know, you have a real battle to get anywhere in there. And, and, and it's, a, it's a law unto themselves. No, it needs breaking up and in some way completely rehabilitating somewhere else. But that's now, a- that could be moved. Yeah. And that, that sense of place, though, is important because, I mean, the Big Ben story is the latest example, but even in a Scottish context, Edinburgh and Glasgow dominate. So I remember working on a news programme where we actually did a television piece about a service station that's halfway between Edinburgh and Glasgow having uh, the overhead tunnel being mm-hmm, moved mm-hmm. somewhere else. And I was just thinking, somebody in Inverness does not care mm-hmm. about service station tunnel. Yeah. And, and, and we had, um, I remember constantly fighting when I was a, a very junior journalist when I first started at the BBC, and one of my first jobs was making up the news bulletins for radio that goes in the programmes and having fights with the, my seniors because 200 people will have died in a ferry disaster in Bangladesh and it would only make the bottom two stories in a long bulletin, it wouldn't make yeah. a short bulletin, but three people would be killed by ETA in Spain and that would make and it would be very high up mm. because there was that idea of sense of place or mm. people in Britain knew Spain better, they hadn't really yeah. been to Bangladesh and, and, and the idea that, that actually... All human life is, is not measured the same in news. Hmm. Um, and I don't think we've ever squared that circle. In, no, in I don't think UK. we have. But then on the other hand, you're very lucky in this country. This is the great hidden secret of the United Kingdom. The most beautiful parts of the whole of this country, if we judge Britain as a whole. I mean, Harris. Oh, Iona. Oh, I mean, the whole of that coast. And then you go to Cromarty and... Inverness and all the way up there. I mean, it is a most spellbinding. And you know, I mean, it's all left alone. The, the newsroom there. It's all left alone. It, it's all left alone. Nobody knows about it. It's all beautiful. fine. Absolutely beautiful. So let's keep it that way. <laughs> okay. Well, let's go back to the to the floor. Uh, I'm sure we've got a, another question or, or two for you. Uh, we're in the last ten minutes, so uh, last chance, gentlemen, right down the front, white shirt, if you could. Thank you. Uh, David Henry, SBC TV. Uh, Do you think fake news is being affected by the blurring of lines between politicians and celebrities and the jumping from one side to the other? Um, The Ed Balls question. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure that that's really the threat to um, to politics per se. I, I, I do think that, uh, here's a controversial thing, I don't actually think MPs are paid enough. Uh, I think they should be paid more and not allowed to do second jobs and not allowed to have their wives working for them. Um, And I think they should be properly resourced, properly housed, uh, and they should uh, meet in a sensible and intelligent way and get about the country and meet meet the people they're responsible for. I think our our politics are, to some extent, in in some organisational trouble. And I actually think that the 
17.5% of our GDP uh, that is enshrined within the activities of the city have drained uh, society of quite a lot of management, capacity, leadership, and the rest of it. I often go there, you know, I, I do meet some very bored people, but they're very happy with their lives beyond the boredom, i.e. outside where they function. Um, so I, I, I mean celebrity, yeah, it's, it, it's a problem. Um, I, I, I have been asked to do, I think I was asked to do um, Strictly, but I, I am extraordinarily unstrict. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm one of the most disorganized, ill-connected people I know, and, and so the, the viewer was spared. Um, but they managed to turn Ed Balls into something quite presentable. <laughs> Another question right down here, gentleman in the suit in the front. There we go. Uh, Martin Kay from SNTV. It's a two-part question. Um, do you think, if the, if the various media organisations you spoke about before, the BBC, ITV, Al Jazeera, CNN, etc., decided, actually, we're not going to make our content available on Facebook, this subscription thing of Zuckerberg, I think, is a, a fig leaf, a bit like the Google News Initiative. If you all said, we are not putting our content in this place, is that a good decision to cause people to, to be forced so you could earn proper money, or is that just a quixotic waste of time and, and, and it would be to spite one's face? I think they would spite their own face. I think the thing we've got to do is to, is to try very, very hard to persuade Facebook to go the direction that Zuckerberg has spelt out. Um, because, you know, the fact is people have travelled to Facebook in vast, vast numbers. It is said, you know, something like a quarter of the world is in some way on Facebook. Um, and uh, I think you have to go with the flow and make it work for you. I, I think, sort of say, it's enormous, it's draining the swamp, we've got terrible trouble, but we're not going to have anything to do with it. We have to challenge it and, and make it work for us. We've made it work for us, but we haven't made it pay for us. Is this the printing press? Is this pamphlets? Is this yeah. all of this? This is yeah. the, that level of disruption? Yeah. yeah okay. it's, it's a big moment. Well, I know that you've got to be away pretty sharply. Yep. Uh, head back down to that London. Um, so a couple of later questions just before we let you oh, go. The, the hard part is over. Is it? Oh, oh there you go. You can yeah. relax. Have a relax. Um, this is where you get caught. Exactly. Uh, so of all the people that you've interviewed, two-part question, who would you like to put on a desert island and leave there? Uh, and who would you quite like to share one with? Hmm, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, the funny thing, I had to do an obituary for Margaret Thatcher. And um, uh, it turned out to be a very affectionate one. I mean, I, was in, I interviewed her about 20 times, and the score was Thatcher 20, Snow Lill. <laughs> um, she was an absolute brute to interview. Uh, uh, but there was something about her that was... I couldn't possibly cope with her on a desert island. And nor would I really want to leave her there. But I can understand there might be people who, even some of the people who worked for her, who might feel that was the thing to do. Careful, you're almost straying into diplomacy, John. This isn't why we're here. <laughs> yes. Um, I, 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 I'm not really close to the political classes, I must admit. I can't really think of anybody I, 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 that I dislike enough to put on her. A desert island. I mean, I certainly wouldn't mind putting Donald Trump on a desert island, yes. I haven't interviewed him, but I've been in the same room too many times. And Let's I take want... his phone off him first, shall we? Yes. Yeah. Well, God, we don't want him tweeting from the desert island. <laughs> um, uh, no, and I, I think, I think the, the, there should be access to the waters around the island so that you can sort of see him sitting there uh, underneath the tree, you know, with his thatch beginning to fall to pieces. Um, I think it would be, it would be a, a, a really a, quite a lovely thing to do. I, I That'd be thing. Um, I've so got that, a picture that's of that. you in a rowing boat, just yes. going around the desert island, shouting "There she goes, Captain Ahab!" at him, and things like that. No, is that naughty? Well, that, that, well, anyway, I think that deals with that bit of it. Okay. The question now is, who would I like to be? Which politician I would like to be on a desert island with? Um, Not a politician. Hey, how about you? How about you? I'd like that. I might eat a lot of the coconuts. No, I think it's good. You, because you're a colonel, I, you, 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 would, you would defend my security. Um, 
and, and we'd have a friendship, which would be lovely. <laughs> I'm sure we would. <laughs> and your final, final question as we wrap up. How does it feel? That was a dangerous area, wasn't it? <laughs> how to be this close to national treasure status? Does it terrify you? Uh, to be absolutely honest, I promise you, I'm uh, totally unaware of it. As you go along on your bicycle and, and people say, fucking tell us, stop getting out of here, you've gone over a zebra crossing or whatever it is you've done, or through a red light or whatever. I never do either, of course, but, um, <laughs> but you know, you, you are kept in your place if you ride a bicycle in London. Uh, you really are scum. <laughs> so, the, the idea that that in some way could be shone into some kind of national treasure status is, eludes me. Oh, John Snow, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your years. Well, thank what a marvellous guest. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.